Hi, it's me, Sue's Pratt, the Holistic Stylist. Welcome to the broadcast of my show, Sophia's Emporium, that was published on July 16th, 2016. The name of this show is Blood Type, Secret Knowledge, and the Adi Adamos. D Adamos. Okay. Although you will be hearing my guests and I discuss the esoteric and metaphysical aspects of what is associated with blood type and whether it's positive or negative, you know, originally in 2005, when I began living for my blood type as a way to not only, oh, say help with my physical um, deficiencies or needs. It was also to help with stress. And so I just wanted you to see this book before we start the broadcast for blood types. And, you know, I don't even believe in the word diet. They don't mean it in a way to lose weight. They mean it like um, what is your staple foods that you eat. But this is Eat Right for Your Blood Type by Dr. Peter J. Diadamo. But he has a book also that walked out of my library years ago called Live Right for Your Blood Type. And if it would be me, that would be the one I would suggest. Eat Right is much more annoying when you find out everything you're putting in you <clears throat> may or may not be good for you, right? So let's share the screen and get the party started. And we're going to jump into this about 15 minutes in. There's a lot of talk about Max Spears in the beginning, and uh, I'm sure you guys know about that. We're going we're gonna to stick to uh, blood type. Enjoy. Sticking to the, the blood group thing today, but um, Max interestingly speaks about blood groups as well. So um, yeah, do let, let's um, honor Here. him watching his uh, work. Here's what I was fishing for: is right. with you being a B blood type, yep. and of course, you have the most resilient physiology. They would say this ultimate strongest, okay? Um, they mentioned this hive mind, and so I wanted to bring that up before we start the show, because as we speak about this on a spiritual or an esoteric level, so many people get their feelings hurt, and they have a very hard time when they realize that they have an off-planet lineage, possibly, that they weren't too sure about. So the way I saw the hive mind was that, of course, you're connected to the white light and, uh, and the hive mind of this process that we're, we've all come into where we're telepathically linked to one another and fighting a good fight. Yeah. Right. So when people hear hive mind, Sometimes they think that they can be controlled, and I just wanted to say that if you're standing strong in your truth like you are, there's no entity that they can control you. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and um, interestingly, that's really where we're going. We're going from the world of duality into high mind unity consciousness. Um, for the, for the altruistic uh, benefit of all sentient beings and all you know all planets and all you know realms if you like or dimensions, um, so really by you know we, we all have a choice to make as a as a member of humanity and that is service to self or or noble service to others, and um, you know and it's interesting that you know certain blood groups um, come with certain personalities and as we mentioned uh, endurances and even food sensitivities um one of the um i know that you've got a similar book uh here uh in on your desk suits but this is a really um awesome book to to have a look at 
Um, it's eat right for your type. It's the complete blood type encyclopedia. It's by Dr. Peter J. Adamo. <laughs> and, um, and you've got the individualized details encyclopedia. I mean, these books are pretty thick, as you can see. Um, but, you know, once you know your blood type, Suze, as you mentioned before, it opens up a whole realm of, of um, opportunities, both in nutrition and well-being and longevity. Um, it could be the difference between, you know, not losing weight um, or correcting one's diabetes or how easy cancer is to overcome So um, or any other ailments, in fact. So by knowing which, you know, um, supplements, you know, which foods to take and which ones to avoid according to your blood group. I mean, it just opens up a whole wonderful realm of possibilities. And just looking at me, um, for those who don't know my background, um, you might not think that uh, I'm Asiatic, but in fact I am. And when you look at the B blood group, it's um, nomadic Mongolian. And that, that actually is something that I can prove um, through genealogy. Um, I'm actually Hungarian. My um, I, I, that was my first language, Maja. Um And uh, my mother's old people, you know, passed down through old, old traditions, always said that we came from Attila the Hun, and that's where the word Hungarian comes from. Um, and in fact, we're Transylvanian aristocracy because Transylvania, which is now part of Romania, when the borders changed in the Treaty of Trianon in 1920, before that it was Hungarian, you know, so as and part of the Austrian Hungarian Empire. Um, so my family actually comes from a, a, a line of Omegs way back, way, way back, and can actually trace. Uh, their, their lineage back uh, from from Central Europe, uh, where the dragon bloodline of, of Count Vlad Tepes or Count uh, from the House of Dracul, if you like, um, came from, um, whose ancestor was Genghis Khan, and, and as we know, he's the Mongolian or the Asiatic lineage, um, coming all the way up to modern present day with me um, and uh, and I'm Mongolian blood type B as I mentioned before. However, because, um, and, and this, I wanted to speak about my mother's side here particularly because it's quite interesting to and viewers. Um, so I'm the product of my parents' second marriage and my mother when she first got pregnant, uh, sorry, first got married with her first husband, she was, falling pregnant quite frequently, so she didn't have a problem uh, with getting pregnant. Um, second marriage was really different. Um, and when she married my father, she actually miscarried three babies in, um, in the early, earlier trimesters um, before I held on <laughs> and came through. And I had quite an unusual birth. Now, um, my mother and her brother are medically trained, um, and so therefore they came to know their blood group. Um, my mother and her brother um, both uh, worked in hospitals and were regular blood donors, um, and they were O negatives and highly sought after O negatives because we come from a transplanting aristocracy and a particularly rich, I guess, you know. Um, Oneg quality. Um, however, as I mentioned before, that I'm a B, and um, and so what happens when a, a B positive child grows within an O negative mother? We see we have these things called rhesus factor, which I'm not sure if people know about, but it might be good to have a look at that. So the OMEG is like the universal blood type that can give to all. And my feeling on that is because it knows every other, it has to know every other blood group to be able to give to every other blood group. And as it can give to every other blood group, my theory is that it has to be the parental blood group, if you like. You're absolutely correct. And so if we apply that thesis, 
And we start out by saying that originally, everyone was an O positive blood type, theoretically. Now, this would be before any uh, altercations happened, any, any adaptations, any influence from any other group. Isn't it amazing that now we are down to 38% of O blood types? And something else to explore is generally the negative blood type has a higher immune system. So you have to ask yourself, where did all the O's go? And so historically, a lot of the O blood types were wiped out through things like the Black Plague that swept through Europe or different illnesses like smallpox and things that have been technically eradicated. The O's have a natural immune system built in and the statistics are between the four blood types that only 15% of the population is negative and I would be one of those negative blood types, I'm A negative. And the way that I came to find that out, of course, is when I was pregnant with my first child at 23. So they blood type you. And of course, if you are negative and the father is positive, then they have to give a injection that they call Rogam. And you get that at 20 weeks along. Then after the birth of the child, if the, if the child has negative blood, you wouldn't need to get that second Rogaine shot. But usually, say in the days before the Rogaine shot, because that came around between 1937 and 1940. Yeah. Ask the skincare experts at Massage Envy about new advanced services like a customized healthy skin facial, men's facial, and signature advanced facial session. Visit massageenvy.com slash skincare to learn more. Between 1937 and 1940. Yeah. Right. The first baby would be born fine, but the blood would be mixed between the mother and child during the passage through the birth canal, and that's when the sensitization would happen. Yeah, yeah, and it also there's a risk of miscarriage as as with my full blood siblings, three full blood siblings before I came through um, with hemolytic disease because uh, of that transference of the positive blood into um, the the O negative mother, which can cause spontaneous abortion um, or miscarriage because it's a uh, it, it's it's like the bo the mother's body develops like antigens it's like an allergic reaction or a foreign parasite now if we are one human species why is there such a thing as a foreign body in a mother and as i was to my mother now um the reason why my mother lost uh, three babies before me is i i don't think they they had diagnosed um, hemolytic disease um, with newborns because she lost them before 20 weeks right. um, which you know it was always in the first um, trimester or the or the early in the second you know um, and so with me uh, they just said to my mother they didn't give her an injection but I had no injections to prevent uh, loss and they just told mum to lay flat on her back for, for the you know most of her pregnancy just to stop any miscarriage from happening um and the, here's the interesting thing there's quite quite a few interesting aspects to this story um is that when she was lying down she, she never had any gestational diabetes or anything that was uh, uh, you know add to the fact that I was a big baby um, but as she progressed in her pregnancy she um, people would remark on her size on her on the size of her belly and are you sure you're only 20 weeks are you sure you're only 30 weeks are you sure there's not two in there 
So she went and got a X-ray. This was in 1969. So just for people wondering why she didn't get an ultrasound or something. Um, and and the doctors just came out and said, "Um, oh, sorry, Mrs. Kovacs, you're you're carrying one. You're carrying one, but she's a big one. You know, all, all the babies a big one." Um, when mum was about 37 weeks, they induced her um, because I was putting on a pound a week at that stage. Um, full term, if I hadn't gone full term, I would have been 17 pounds. Bless your heart. So, they, so I was a premature baby born uh, at 37 weeks and I was 14 pounds, which is the size of two newborn babies. Because I was premature giant, um, I was put in a humidity crib under the blue lights because I was jaundiced, which is another thing to um, watch with these with these little premies and and also um, some of the blood disorders. Jaundice is a, it, it you know can be a problem, and so I went from yellow to pink eventually, but. Being in special care nursery as a preemie and looking as big as a three-month-old baby, a lot of people took a lot of notice, you know. <laughs> um, but in fact, um, yeah, I'm not sure whether hemolytic disease um, was a contributing factor because I, I know my mother didn't have gestational diabetes, nor did she have diabetes to this day, which is 80. Well, though, so if, if we explore the royal families, of course, they had a lot of problem with that is yes. the hemophilia yes and one of the tie overs that I see happening so much today is this inflammation that occurs in the brain and that ties that ties into it somehow just, just like how um, the whole thing of toxemia ties in uh, when I was pregnant with every one of my children as an A negative, I was always anemic and I always had toxemia. So when you spoke about your mom needing to lay flat, they usually do do that with high risk pregnancy. Yeah. I never went to that extreme. One thing I do want to show everyone real quick, because no matter who it is, pretty much we're going to be iron deficient. And when we're pregnant, you know, it's a whole nightmare about should we take the iron or not because then we wind up with constipation. Yeah. So this is a liquid iron. Let me get my finger out of the way. Can I turn it over, love? Turn it, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm backwards. So sorry. Okay. Pure absorb spartone iron. So that's a that's a dissolving iron supplement in the water. Yes, it's already liquid. So you just oh, it's already liquid. Okay, cool. Right, empty it right into your water, and this is very helpful. So I'd always suggest for anyone that's dealt with anemia to supplement with something like this, and it's pure absorb. I got this from the same people that I order my Bach flower essence from. Oh, great, great. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's wonderful. One of the biggest things about this subject we're going to talk about today with the blood type is counting poisons. And so I can remember when I first looked at this book back in 2004, it was so upsetting to me because when I read the list of the things that I put in my body, whether it was food or drink, I realized that maybe six out of 10 of what I was taking in was poison and some very innocent. Like for example, margarine will be a poison to everybody, no matter what their blood type, because it's kind of plastic. It just doesn't digest too well. But A blood types have a lower amount of stomach acid, so butter is hard to digest being a fat, and that's why they would say this would be a poison. But when I looked at my list, it was really just about trying to eliminate a couple poisons. 
fact, there's a huge benefit to the immune system as a whole. And, and oh, absolutely. absolutely. And at the back of the blood group book, whether you've got Suits's copy or mine or, or a similar uh, version by Dr. Peter Damo, they have charts in the back that refer to certain um, food sources and how poisonous they are, as you were mentioning, Susan. So if we look at something like wheat flour, right, or wheat products, there's certain blood groups that really should be avoiding it altogether. And if you're an O blood group, you really should be avoiding your wheat, uh, wheat products. Um, and then other blood groups might be neutral. But these are the ways that we can really filter out what's good for us and why not, or why things are feeling funny digestively, or why we can't lose weight, or why we, you know, are full of mucus. Um, you know, it's amazing just what, how beneficial it is to look at food products and blood types. Well, and I think that the O blood type has the most difficult difficult road because what is so poisonous for them as well is mixing proteins and starches. So if you think about how so many people were conditioned to eat from the four food groups of one sitting on a plate, those things don't digest the same. And so O's have a tremendous amount of stomach acid and that's why they're prone to things like GERD and think uh, different oh. intestines. Ulcers, yeah. Yep. Exactly, the ulcers, all of it. So if they put carbohydrates or starches into their stomach at the same time as they put that nice piece of red meat or something like that, they really have a lot of troubles. They also have problem with um, the collection of plaque in their arteries. Yeah, so if you're no negative, you know, having a roast dinner with, with you know, family um, with some roast potatoes, a nice piece of bread um, and, and a nice cut of roast beef or whatever, or if you're in an office and you're having um, a ham sandwich, right, you've got your proteins and your carbs together and roast, roast meal with family, proteins and carbs together, and you wonder why you can never get better or you wonder why you know you're, you're toxic or you're getting heartburn and this is this is actually a, an amazing revelation once you can look at tailoring your diet to suit you i have a funny story from when i started eating for my blood type and so my ex-husband was an o i always think that sounds funny and he was really into the Atkins diet back at the turn of the century. And he told me that I would look better and lose some weight if I eliminated carbohydrates out of my diet. And of course, I always did want to maintain my, you know, my looks and my shape and everything. So I said, all right, I'll give up my bread. And I started eating hamburger patties with a slice of onion and a slice of tomato and salt and pepper. And even though it tasted good, I found myself getting really, really crabby. Not just because I was being controlled, but because my stomach felt like it did when I was a teenager and I ate McDonald's. You know, just that bad feeling where you want to unpin your jeans and and you got, you got bloated and you felt toxic. Yeah, very, very much. And after doing this a couple of weeks, CAs internalize their stress just a little bit too. We want everybody to get along, mm. and so that fire kind of raged up in me, and I exploded. You know, and I told him I this sucks. I, I don't want anything to do with the Atkins diet. And at the same time, I had seen Dr. Diadamo's book. One of my clients was carrying it with her all the time. She was an O-neg that had seven children and was absolutely beautiful. So she was way into the Atkins scene back then. But I, I said to her, let me look at that book. Let me 
me explore that book. And that's how it happened for me. So I decided that I was going to give up red meat. That was my favorite, my favorite naughty kind of uh, treat. I would give myself a good filet mignon. Yeah, gave that up. Gave up dairy products as far as from cows go. Now, I still do eat cheese, of course, because I only eat about a dozen things anymore once you start refining yourself like this. And so cheese, again, is an acceptable poison. I'll never give it up. But there's a huge difference between going to a local or a small-owned meat market and getting some good, clean farmer cheese or going to your local uh, corporation and buying that American cheese with the yellow dye. So when, when we go to talk about poisons, we have to be discerning because it's about percentages as we work. Say, for example, someone that is predisposed to not be able to handle leptin. They should never take a big bite out of a tomato because there's so much acid, so much leptin. But if they really like the taste of that tomato, if it's diced up small and put into a dish, it won't affect them in the same way. Yeah, that's right. And um, I mean, do have a look at it because it could be things that are hiding in your diet that are making you feel unwell, like, you know, certain blood groups, again, with O, uh, they need to avoid uh, kidney beans, but because, uh, you know, you mentioned the lectins, um, and, uh, you know, and A's need to avoid the lectins as well as the O's. So kidney beans are out, um, as are some lentils for the O's as well. Um, so <laughs> it gets quite complex, but once... Rather than looking at what to avoid, because that's probably a long list, um, maybe look at some of you, look, when you're looking up the blood group diet, look at what your favourite foods are and tick, tick those and then put them on your shopping list rather than, you know, focusing on, oh, you mean I can't have, you know, I'm an A and I can't have rabbit anymore? <laughs> you know. Right. And yeah. another thing that works really well is go to the beneficial list for your blood type. Yeah. And like this, everything yeah. you choose from that beneficial list is a healing food, and it actually acts like a filter and absorbs the poisons out of your body. For an A blood type, peanuts or sunflower seeds would be that very thing, where, say, a cashew would be the opposite. Mm. Yeah, so yeah. really important to know. And, um, and if we have a look at um, certain blood groups, we see that there's a predisposition in many in many cultures to have a more dominant blood group. And we see um, most of the, uh, there's a higher, the high, I think the highest population of O-Negs is in the, the Basque region, isn't it? There's, um, and in regards to the bees, where because I'm Asi you know Asiatic European, um, you know the, the Mongolian nomads, or the, in other words, the Himalayans, that's the Tibetans, um, you know Afghans, Pakistan, you know there, there's a whole area, Iranians and Persians, uh, that, you know around from around there, um, there is you know, a high influx of bees coming through as well as the O-Negs in that, in that particular region. Um, and I think that's where really the crossbreeding um, took place. But, you know, I believe in it, that we are all star beings from different constellations. So rather than getting stuck on, oh, I'm an Anunnaki or, or I'm, you know, I'm part reptilian or anything like that, rather than freaking out over that, just probably know that we're all colonists from many different star systems. And here we have a, a beautiful human mosaic um, of, of, you know, Baroque evolutionary possibilities um, where we have come from the Pleiades, from Andromeda, 
from Nibiru, from, from, you know, so many different star constellations. Now, when they talk about the rhesus factor itself, I know that there's, you know, a lot of people say, well, th does that mean that I've got the monkey gene because we all know about the rhesus monkey used in lab experiments? But it basically means like a, a, a primate that has been found on Earth for a long time. Now, early geneticists, and some people say, if you have a look at the writings of Zechariah Sitchin, although I have some other opinions about Zechariah Sitchin, <laughs> but um, in particular to his work in transcribing the Sumerian tablets, which were written in cuneiform, um, we see that, uh, that he talks about this race that came from um, you know, um, another constellation that seeded this planet and then there was genetic experiments. So we, and we hear things like the 12 strand DNA of a Cadmon body and we look at the dumbed down cloned version or the slave version of Eve. I mean, we really are a mosaic of, of, of different genetic heritage and this comes out in our blood groups and this comes out in the way that some women can easily get um, pregnant and have babies and, and then and change, in, in my mother's case when she changed husbands um, that that pregnancy and holding on to it that becomes all that much harder. Now going into the Transylvanian uh, heritage um, it, interestingly my mother's family name is Ombrush, A-M-B-R-U-S, and Ambrus, and that is the same word as Ambrose in England, or Ambrosio in Italy, or Ambrosius, uh, you know, in, in Old Rome, or uh, there's, there's many different variations of this name, but etymologically it means Ambrosia, of course. Now, what is Ambrosia? Ambrosia is next to the gods, the divine nectar of immortality. Now, why would my um, aristocratic uh, Transylvanian Count Vlad, tracing back to Sumeria and, and, and Genghis Khan, um, you know, in interbreeding, uh, why, why would a name like Ambrosia come through? Now, I believe because of I know my family's blood group and I know their temperament and 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 my mother's side, you know, and, and my, their temperament. By the way, I have no negative, uh, I have no negative sons as well. It must have been because um, of, of who their father was. Um, so, so again, even though the old Neg jumped, uh, bypassed me, I was born into an O negative mother and I gave birth to O negative children. Um, one of my sons has um, blondish, reddish hair and aquamarine eyes, and you'll see that certain blood groups present in certain ways too. But getting back to the ambrosia uh, word, um, divine nectar of immortality, when we're talking about what, you know, what do they mean by that, it sounds like a god gene or... Or, or the fruit of the gods, or the, um, and, and one would consider, or well, here's my hypothesis that Enkian and Lil, the, the first um, colonists in the Anunnaki blood type and, and, and genetic uh, race family, root family that came in here, although there was other root families here as well. But Enkin and Lil in particular, I, my hypothesis is that they were O negative um, because the family can trace themselves back to uh, that lineage uh, through the house of um, Dracul and, um, and Genghis Khan as well, and back to ancient Sumeria. Right, and there is your off planet influence. Yeah, now, something that we spoke about the other night privately that I just wanted to bring up and share with everyone is this whole idea about the rhesus factor being named after monkeys. That was specifically because monkeys were the main animal that were used in the medical experiments. In a better word that we may use, 
that will help people come together would be a mammal. And we know we're mammals because, of course, our breasts feed our babies. So it works a little bit better for me at this point. And as far as the negative aspect to that bloodline, and then, of course, being that you come from a long line of O's, B is a combination of the O and the A blood group. That's how they get it. Is to, so you would probably have inherited the B from a grandparent. They said those things skip like that. I know in my case, as an A negative, I did spend some time asking my parents, well, which one of you are negative? And they both looked at me like I was kind of crazy and said, well, neither one of us. Now, that can be, and I'll, I'll share this hypothesis with you. So my paternal grandmother was told after she had her first son, my Uncle George, do not have any more babies. It could kill you. But, of course, back then, birth control was illegal. And, you know, if a child is conceived, then it's meant to be. And so when she became pregnant with my father, I know that she wasn't in very good health. No one knew it yet. When she delivered my father, he was born with a birth defect. And what that was comes from the hemophiliac background, which would be the varicose veins. That's one of the, the side effects of that. And his legs almost looked like they had been affected by polio as far as the direction one of them turned out. He wore special shoes when he was young. And this must have been very traumatizing to him because he never mentioned it. We didn't find those shoes until after his passing. Wow. Yes, and when I asked him about that background, because, you know, I do a lot with life charting, and his mother admitted to a cancer hospital in Jefferson City, and that was in 1959, and she was actually almost black. You know, her skin had been blackened from the trauma. Yeah, and I, I said to him, I said, Dad, when did when did Grandma Opal have cancer? And he said, never. And I was like, look at this article. So that's when we get into the trauma of the bloodlines. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. And interestingly, like, when you say black, did she, was it like a dark shade of purple? Well, it's a black and white photograph. So she oh, looks. Right. She looks gray. Right, okay. Right, and her natural color would have been um, not really a pink undertone like mine, maybe a little bit more yellow like yours. Do you know what yeah. I mean? The, yeah. Yeah, I, I never knew her to be that color. She looked like she had been on holiday for months and was mm. dark tan. Interesting. Yeah, and I, I think that was one of the problems with my dad as I look back on it because he was also a young sign of the Zodiac. He was an Aries and just wanted to live and learn and love and be a baby and be taken care of. But I don't think his mom was physically capable when she passed. Oh, I guess it was... She would have been in her early 70s. She made it through 50 years of marriage. So, crazy. Yes. Um, <clears throat> my dog is crying. I'm sorry if you if you hear that in the background. He has psoriasis. Um, yes. 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 No. What's What's your dog's blood type? Do you know anything about the dog and what it could be eating that could be causing psoriasis, perhaps? Well, that's an excellent question, and I was doing a little bit of reading that kind of suggested that more dogs than not would be O's, but just like the Royals, 
I think when they do this fancy pedigree breeding, yeah. then you can wind up with the worst traits. Yeah. And, and, and a Sharpe, which is part the Sinji and part Sharpe. Yeah. They have dry skin. But it's, it's it, as you know, the weather conditions around the globe are pretty sporadic, and it's been a very difficult summer. A lot of people's loved ones have yeah. stepped out of their physical this year, along with everybody's animals are sick. So, right. it's pretty. I, I think it's uh, something that's going on with the times that we're seeing. And so, for example, if we live right or eat right for our blood type, <clears throat> we can avoid many viruses and infections. And like you said earlier, we can lose weight as our body rids itself of toxins. Uh, for example, too, like say, I'm an A blood type and we are predisposed to cancer. So we, um, you know, use this philosophy. We can alleviate predisposition to it. And if we have it, we're fine until we drop. And so that's okay with me. I just want to be healthy while I'm here and I want to feel well. They say that A blood types, they never are diagnosed early like an O is. An O has a symmetrical shaped cell and cancer cells and different diseases and disorders tend to take on irregular shapes. If you put a drop of A blood under a microscope, it looks similar to a cancer cell. They are irregular. They are not that perfect little round cell. And I know, say for example, I talk about John Wayne a lot when we talk about blood type. He was an A blood type that loved meat. And when he passed, you know, this strong, virile man, and they did the autopsy, they said, well, you know, he had cancer. And everybody looked at his smoking. But behind the scenes, he had a nine-foot tapeworm. So if, if we don't eat for our blood type, we do have a higher chance of getting worms and parasites because our body can't fight them off. I passed liver flukes years ago when I did my body cleanses. You always start with a colon cleanse and then you go from there. But uh, they say that liver flukes, that A's have a predisposition to that, and it comes from tropical regions. And do you remember when you would have picked up on that? Because uh, uh, one of the uh, pieces of land uh, commune that I was looking at putting my teepee on, because I have to move my teepee next month, I was looking at one piece of land, and um, the water... Uh, the, the stream right in front of where my teepee would have gone, um, I, I heard by the landowner that, that it had a problem with liver fluke and you still have to need uh, access to uh, alternative sources of water. And what concerned me when I had a look at the health of the beings on that land, um, that there was a lot of anger amongst the residents there um, and anger uh, related to liver. Um, but also that the cows on the property were emaciated even though they were knee-deep knee in uh, high grass, high thick, lush, subtropical grass. And, um, and I just thought, you know, there's so, so many even emotional problems can stem from organ imbalance, such as um, liver fluke, um, that if you can get rid of that with detoxes, such as what you're talking about, Sue's, you can see the health of a property, the health of your family, the health of your livestock, um, and and a happier disposition for all who are on there. Um, it, it's it's quite perilous, and um, I, I know someone else in the alternative um, community who I'm, I haven't been given permission to share his to, to name him, but uh, somebody um, that I've had on the show. Um, mentioned to me that he passed a huge take when, when he went into a detox as well and uh, it's just amazing 
you know, what can be lurking in our systems and gallstones and everything. But once we start eating right and, and doing these cleanses and detoxes, just how dramatically we can shift even things like cancer. Well, I can share with you how I picked up the liver flukes. And yeah. Right. And after I tell the story, it will make perfect sense why they say that they're waterborne and transmitted through a host such as a snail. So what happened with me is that I love plants and I had like 120 tropical plants at the hair emporium. I was always collecting. So the one day I went by a nursery and there was a papyrus plant out in the front and it was for sale. And so I pulled in there and my question was to the nursery, could I grow this in water because I didn't have a pond? And they said, well, sure. And it was in this big mud ball. So I took it back to the shop and I put it in the shampoo bowl and started rinsing the, the mud off of this plant. And of course, the poor thing went into shock and I had to divide it off into three different root balls and the one survived. So I put it into a big fish bowl and it was really like a talking point at the hair shop because I could show people the sea monkeys that were in the water. Wow. Right, and then here in the States when we were kids, you know, you could send off and buy some sea monkeys for $1.99, but what they really were was brine shrimp. So, mm -hmm. Right, so here I was being silly, and I would stick my hand in that water, and I would swirl it around so people could see the sea monkeys. Well, as a hairdresser, of course, my hands were full of these little tiny cuts. And right in oh, it went out. There you go. Right. And then what happened, and, and there's so many ways to do cleanses, but the biggest problem for people is most people either would work at a job where they could not have the sovereignty as adults to go to the bathroom. Yeah. That blows my mind. As a self-employed person, <clears throat> I was always able to excuse myself and go to the bathroom and people trusted me that I would come back. You know what I mean? It, 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 it's something. But the other group of people can't do it because they already are having uh, chronic IBS or chronic constipation. And if the system is that clogged up, it's almost impossible to actually do these cleanses where we pass flukes and worms. If, if we go back into old medical books, you know, that's why they had the long hook, like little Bo Peep. And the idea, oh. yeah, the idea was that it would either come out the rectum, where we would expect, or that it would come out through the esophagus. And what they would do with the hook is get the worm to curl itself around it, like you would imagine a snake charmer would do. Oh my gosh. More visual. And since it was biohazard, once the person passed it, then they had an easy carry way to take this worm and burn it. Yes. Oh God. Right. Yes. You just don't uh, you pull it out of the rectum. Right. Right. And and now I think Sue's says but you don't want to do that because they can separate and they reproduce on their own. They don't need a family. They break off in meiosis. They're asexual. Okay, that's interesting. Right. And 
when I passed the liver flukes, the first day that I passed one, it was so painful. I thought maybe it was a squished up raisin or something. I'm gonna draw the actual size of it for you. See that little circle and the dot that you see up there is actually where the mouth was. And so they attach like sucker fish. Oh my God. Some okay, have, that's what little fruits are interesting. Right. Some have teeth, some have suction cups. Mm -hmm. I always think of any parasite as something that I just don't want attached to me and I want it to spell the right way. So I wouldn't suggest pulling on something like that. But the first time that I passed one, it wasn't moving. And so, like I said, I didn't know that that's what it was. But on the second day, I passed another one that size. And there was a little one with it. And that little one was swimming in the toilet. Oh my God. So, and, and this is why I chose not to actually move my TP next month to this property with the liver fluke problem in the water because of the emotional problems on the land and the emaciated look of the cows. Um, and I'm actually moving it on to another property. But can you just go into the protocol of how to get rid of liver fluke? Uh, because I have a lot of friends up in the tropical areas on these communes um that um may sometimes get in touch with water like that uh maybe if you know how to um detox mm -hmm. right yeah. we we would put together a lifestyle program for that person so the first thing i would say is in the in the blood type book they have a protocol that you can follow for pre-surgery so you get the best result and if you're going to pass any kind of parasite, I would put that in the same lines as a surgery, to be, to be honest. So they would um, support their immune system well. Yeah. Now, I have never, ever seen a product as good as this one. And this is what I used to retail at the salon. So let me put that up to the screen for a minute. It's called Sculpt and Cleanse. And of course, it's pretty much designed as something, you know, people want their weight loss. But this cleanse is a three month cleanse and it is very, very strong. Right. So, right. Sometimes people go to a health food store and they get like a one week colon cleanse or they get a one month kind of a cleanse. Detox, gallbladder, yeah, weekend right. bloody cleanse. <laughs> and I, I, right, and I'm going to say from my experience that that's not adequate because this was a three month cleanse. Wow. Three months of my life, girl. And um, I, I, feel passed, I, I passed the flutes towards the end. Look, I've done Master Cleanse myself, and in, in 21 days of Master Cleanse, I dropped two gallstones that big into the toilet, and I was, by that time, there was nothing in my bowels to pass. Any, no, there was no solid matter to pass, because I was just on um, lemon juice, maple syrup, cane pepper in water. Although I sometimes might add a bit of grated ginger and turmeric in it for my own uh, reasons, um, because I cured myself of cancer naturally. Mm -hmm. So candida, inflammation with, and pH were things I was looking at um, and regulating. So it's part of my detox. You know, I, I've, I've seen uh, the passing of gallstones and also the gallbladder cleanse, which I've spoken about on previous shows on, on CCN, um, is, is a really good protocol. So what did you do in that three-month cleanse? You took that sculpt and shape. So, sorry, sculpt and cleanse products. Right, and, and you work up to the amount of capsules that you would need to have four to five bowel movements a day. And when you work a cleanse like this, for example, B blood type as well as O, 
tends to have a lot of mucus. So one of my friends that was an all blood type, she was actually passing mucus balls. Amazing. Yes. Amazing. Um, um, interesting that you mentioned B and mucus because um, I, I sometimes can sound really quite nasal and I do have some sinus issues and yeah. have childhood asthma. I always thought it was because I was vaccine damaged. But interesting that there's a correlation with diet, which I may not have looked into as well. So mucus forming foods such as dairy, which I love, <laughs> and probably shouldn't having an Asiatic bloodline. Um, you know, uh, just one of those things that I've maybe got to watch a bit, hey? Well, let me, let me jump back for a minute when you were asking about what would I do, because yeah. I, I, I believe that we always need to have a regime that consists of more than one thing. One of the biggest helps that I have seen with my own eyes over the years is people doing castor oil packs. And, and I did do a show on that very subject on CCN. But it's really simple. You take a castor oil pack, well, you, you make this pack either out of organic cotton, organic muslin, or organic wool. And you would saturate whatever you wanted, that medium, with the oil. It would be placed on the liver, which is on the right-hand side of the body, yep. to the right of the belly button. It's a half-moon, crescent-shaped organ. Right. And that is the most gentle cleanse that anyone can do. And it is also, I mean, the technical name of it is the Pama Christ. It's the Pama Christi plan. So mm -hmm. it is healing on every level. But I have seen Joe and his sister both pass um, kidney stones. I amazing, mean, amazing. I wouldn't mind trying that too. Um, I haven't done a castor oil pack, but I've become interested since uh, you've been mentioning them on CCN. Um, and also, do you, do you practice the coffee enemas, Suze? No, I've never had to go to that place. I've always been very regular. And um, I can tell you that, say, like, when you talked about the homeopaths earlier that have lost their lives, you know, Dr. Dick Versendahl worked on me the week before he left his body. And, yeah, and, um, he had a lot to say about the subject of cleaning yourself out. And he said one of the best things for that was apricot juice. He, apricot juice. Right. Okay. Yeah, you, you you know, very that strong. That is amazing because I, um, I use apricot kernels uh, with B17 right. in them. Um, to counteract my, my stage 3 cervical cancer, which I eradicated naturally without surgery, chemo, or radiation. Um, mm -hmm. So, in, the apricots are such a sacred plant. And, fruit. yes, yes, yes. And, and, you know, so many people, it would be their grandparents that would have told the stories of their trauma as children. They used to get marched out like, you know, outside in the morning when the sun was coming up, and they would look at their anus to see if there were worms wiggling around it. And that's where that old story came in about having to take a teaspoon of castor oil. And, of course, the texture of that was terrible for these children to take, and they were already traumatized that someone was messing with their... You know, they're a very private area like that. So, huh. I believe that that's why it was kind of uh, why jobs the face of existence. My cat is asking to go out, excuse me. She rings the doorbell. Uh -huh. <coughs> that's the cat that plays piano on Randy's show. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. It's interesting and it's amazing how, you know, we did those inspections on kids for certain reasons, um, you know, for, for cleanliness and parasites and hygiene and 
some of the old old ways that have got, you know gone out the window, but there's still surefire ways of knowing whether you need to you know worm your kids or worm your animals. But interesting that you're talking about natural worming products and parasite eradication rather than being pharmaceutical grade products, which you know you and I don't really pay for practice. Well, so, the natural herbal is wormwood, but of course, there you go. Look at the name of it. Right, and then we have old stories to go with it. So let me say yeah. that the reason why so many people were terrified of wormwood was because there was a potential always for miscarriage or abortion. Right, of course. Like that. So, yeah. right, I think it's it's. The etymology of the word, and also that sometimes you don't really know you're pregnant, and all of a sudden you're taking an herbal, and then you find out. Now, I've also had a dear friend, believe it or not, and this is just a sad story. It, um, she had an unwanted pregnancy, and the father wasn't going to be around. And so she got into a book to figure out how she may be able to abort that child. And the wormwood did not abort the child. It was born as a hermaphrodite and had organs on the outside and organs in wrong places. Oh. Yeah. So cool. Massive birth defects. That's a massive birth defect. Major. That's many, many surgeries. Exactly. Oh, dear. You have to be careful. And, and the thing that I always find interesting before we get off the subject of that is that I find it uh, synchronistic that you don't have one hospital that I know of in the United States that would focus on helping people remove their worms and parasites. I mean, that's a huge money-making business. And if you look at the whole disclosure, which I do want to go over the timeline of blood information, because we're going to find a couple things as far as investigative journalists will, where we say, well, I wonder if that's why they figured that out and then quit talking about it. Interesting. I, I'd like you to also, Suze, talk about um, you know, if you've got it on a word presentation, or whether you you know want to read read out on the on the documents that you've pre prepared for the show, I'd really like to talk about um, some of the you know the benefits and the risks for different blood groups because I know people tuning in have their own um, you know interest in in listening to this and how it personally affect them. Right. Um, so can we go through, just being aware of the time that we're, we're on, um, right. if we go through the different um, blood groups and the, and the, you know, the pros and cons of each blood group, please. Yep, and then I do want to say that I put these together. I, I have been doing wellness seminars since 2005. So this was put together a long time ago. And I'd like to do your blood type first, which is the B blood type. Yep. They, they would say that that's approximately 18% of the population. And the good news, we, we have good news and bad news. So the good news for the B blood type is that they are free thinking, resilient, creative, original, subjective, and an inveterate organizer. It says, as a type B, you carry the genetic potential for great flexibility and the ability to thrive in changeable conditions. Your position is fluid rather than stationary, with the ability to move in either direction along the continuum. Now, the reason they say that is, is because your blood type, B, would have been the first one that came together after groups had moved around and mixed. Very, very adaptable. The balancing forces always present in type Bs give them a unique stress profile. The reason they say that 
is because O's externalize their stress, A's mm -hmm. internalize their stress, and you are a product of the O and the A mix. Type B's are an order lately gifted in harnessing the powers of visualization and relaxation, and therefore recover from stress much more quickly than A's. You've got that O externalizing it, you see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, meditation is extremely effective for lowering cortisol levels in type B's. Uh, yeah, interesting that I've, I've practiced Buddhism, yeah. And that's probably why, and especially with coming from a lineage where you know that there are these emotional and, and driven O's, you know what I mean, that are always externalized, and you had to find some way to bring yourself into the center, like when I look at the picture of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, adrenaline and cortisol are one of the biggest things that attack us these days, and those are the stress hormones. So in my blood type, we have both, but yours is particularly focusing on cortisol, and these days they market weight loss products, and they will show a person's middle and say it's because it's an overabundance of cortisol, and I just want people to know that that's not something like a lectin that you can eat. That is a response to stress. Mm. Uh, in general, a healthy type B, living right for their type, tends to have fewer risk factors for diseases and tends to be more physically fit and mentally balanced than any of the other blood types. Type Bs tend to have a greater ability to adapt to altitude and statistically are the tallest of the blood types. So. Here we have your background, like you talked about where your family came from and about, you know, the idea that you were going to be this, you know, majorly large baby unless they, you know, induced labor and got you out of there. Yeah. But now we see that it's not only because of, say, this blood type factor, but it's also in a whole other realm a spiritual thing and that's we true. talked about that yeah, the giants the giants that's right because the uh the anunnaki were like you know there's a lot of relationship um also and okay. with with old pictures of enki and enlil we see that they're quite larger humans than um than the other humans around them on the depictions um if you just look up enki and enlil um sumerian pictures um but, you know, in, in my adult form, okay, so I would have been a 17 pounder full term. Um, my adult form is, I'm, a, I'm five foot five barefoot suits. Right. <laughs> so so I, I, I've manifested a, a normal sized adult woman's body. Um, but, you know, when you talk about spiritual stuff, um, when you look at whales and elephants, um, and the, and what what is the avatar of of a body coming in? The larger the body, the larger the soul matrix. The larger the soul matrix, the larger light form body that can come through and manifest on this earth. That's why um, beings such as whales and elephants are, are are considered so sacred because they've basically got more more soul that has come through with the bigger the body and um. You know, I've always been really spiritual and let you know led that that way inclined. That um, that may have something to do with it. But maybe with uh, oh, yeah. I, 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 would, I would believe it does. And you know, it it it, it strikes me as this truth. Have you ever heard the one where they say you can tell so much about a child's soul by how they take their first step? You know, there's, there's the little kids that they're so scared that first step they take and they're wobbly. And there's some that just hit the floor running. And I would tend to think that someone like yourself or, or even me, I'm only five foot three uh, and a half, but um, you know, 
delivered an eight pound, six ounce baby. And so theoretically, that would be a larger child. Even, even though I'm a smoker, um, Ian was nine pounds, three and a half ounces. Yeah. And I labored in a water tank to have him, yes. So I, I do agree that it would be more about say your akasha and your continual evolution uh through this time and space no time thing it, it's everything that you are and you bring it with you and of course with saying that of course we also have a bad side you know to discuss the side of the good one so because you are empathetic Type B's can be highly sensitive to the effects of slipping out of balance. And there's a technical word for that called maladaptation. So you imagine yourself, you know, like a seesaw. And as long as you take care of yourself, you don't slip out of uh, balance. But if something gets you down or you get sick, they say it's a really hard slide down the hill. And it's hard to recover. It's hard to get back up. So, and one, and one, one. Um, if you look at it like a pyramid, and you look at the your, your structural and your emotional and your mental and then your chemical and nutritional down here, if any of those are deficient, then we no longer have an equilateral triangle to try and cover the the, the weight of it. The other the other um, departments will go into you know extra stress and strenuousness to try and balance out what is deficient or out of balance. So it's really important to have that equilateral triangle or if you want to look at it in a pyramid shape, if you want to incorporate spirit into that, um, the, 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 the further dimensional aspect of that, the triad of health, um, then you'll see the importance of maintaining um, balance in all those areas of your life. So interesting that you brought that up, Susan. Yes, and they say that out of balance, that you suffer from the effects of high cortisol, like we spoke about, and a susceptibility to viral infections, chronic fatigue, mental fogginess, and autoimmune diseases. I think... Every day your scalp comes under attack from heat, sweat, and pollution which causes discomfort and aggravate dandruff so it keeps coming back. Let me show you the difference when you use Head & Shoulders regularly. Unlike ordinary shampoos, Head & Shoulders washes away dandruff and forms an invisible shield that continuously helps protect your scalp. So, there's no reason anyone should suffer from dandruff again. Stay protected every week, month, year. It's easy. Stay flake free for life. Head & Shoulders, live head first. I think with all the investigation that I have been involved with with the vaccine controversy and the way that they can target specific blood types, if I look back on that, I'm going to tell you that that is exactly why when Jonas Salk was working with viruses and making strides for World War II, they yeah. pretty much shunned him. They told him he was nuts. They told him he was focused on the wrong thing. And they told him to work on the bacteria. See, viruses have always been this mystery. And theoretically, we cannot eliminate or treat a virus. They're going to say, well, you just let it run its course. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to say that that's the same thing has happened with this out of control thing with worms and parasites. People just let it run its natural course. And by the time you get to the end of it, the natural result is death. So, yeah. Right. So we do need to take this pretty serious. And you know, these days, having an autoimmune disease is as regular as having a cell phone, isn't it? Everybody's yeah. got an autoimmune. Someone's got chronic fatigue. It could be from heavy metal toxicity, or, or they, they, yeah, they could have, um, you know, arthritis or candida or cancer, or diabetes, um, or hypothyroid or hyperthyroidism. Um, there's just so many common diseases that's like name your poison. Yes. Um, so 
these things, these considerations, you know, nutritional considerations and blood groupings are, are so important. So I really love your list, um, Suze, and I love your research that you've done. Well, Dr. Diadamo said that the majority of the people that suffered from chronic fatigue were the B blood group. Interesting. So, yeah, he spent, he spent, well, not only him, but his father. You know, this is a labor of love between two generations, this whole blood type philosophy work. And if we have time at the end, I'll run the timeline. If not, we'll hit it on another show. Back to, back to the B blood type, though. They have something called syndrome X, and this is a huge thing for the type Bs. It says it is dramatically influenced by the rather idiosyncratic effects of lectins in certain foods. Lectins, to me, sound like super glue. It's, it's a kind of sticky substance that's very hard to break apart. They say that the lectins in chicken, corn, buckwheat, lentils, peanuts, and sesame seeds cause insulin resistance and include polyamine formation resulting in weight gain, fluid retention, and hypoglycemia. In a bee. So I just went to an Indian restaurant last night and I enjoyed a beautiful lentil dal with some rice. Um, so that probably wouldn't have been a good thing for me to eat. That's so interesting you mentioned that. Thank you for sharing because it oh. makes my choice is much easier. You're welcome, really. And, and, you know, the other thing that gets me, since we're on this subject, you know, if you go back to the old story of um, the fava bean down through time, Okay, now I wonder if they're not kind of hiding these fava beans and anything called lentils because anyone that originates from where you do has usually a missing enzyme in their gene. And say Pythagoras and his followers would rather die than cross a fava bean field because they knew it was that toxic. Oh my goodness, isn't that interesting? Mm. Is that a way that they've been getting to people, just like GMOs? I mean, there's there's so many connections. Well, but, you know, some people say that, you know, uh, hippies should avoid the tofus, you know, whether it's soybeans, endomummy, but, you know, the steamed soybeans or the soy milk or the tofu products. Um, because of, of uh, you know toxicities, whether it's because they're genetically modified or whether it's because of the base alien product itself. Right. <clears throat> okay, let's get back to your thing real quick. So there's specific immune conditions for the B blood type. Bacterial infections. You don't produce antibodies against them, they say. And they want bees to pay special attention to kidney and urinary tract infections. And they suggest guarding against flu with regular doses of elderberry, which would be one teaspoon three or four times daily during that season. I don't know if a lot of our listeners know this, but when you study homeopathy and say things like mucus, for example, mm. okay. The medicines they use to treat people for these things, the homeopaths and the doctors always knew that those medicines needed to be adjusted, whether it was different ones or the um, dosage, depending on the season. And I think that's why they bring that up about the dosage during the season. So there's a lot to be learned. And and. Uh, in regards to mucus, like mucus isn't all bad. Mucus is a response to a toxin and it's the body's elimination system. So, if, you know, if you're suffering from um, a sinus attack or, you know, if it's on your chest and you're, and you're coughing up lots of phlegm, um, just realize that with those with those things that will shut the, uh, the, the, um, the, the histamine process off, 
are actually maybe doing more harm than good because it's your body's elimination system. Now, if it can't take remove the garbage from sneezing or coughing it up, it may, in fact, internalise it and form a tumour somewhere inside your body as a last ditch resort to deal with the toxin that it wasn't allowed to, 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 to process out through the mucus causing uh, histamine response. And so there is a sacred reason why we have temperatures. If a virus can only like, it, it, and I'm talking um, Celsius here, because um, we're metric here, but a, a virus can only live, um, you know, a few degrees either side of 37, which is the body's uh, Celsius um, body temperature reading. Now, when we get a temperature of, say, 40 degrees Celsius or 41, which, I don't know, is some kind of something in your language, um, the, the, the body will overheat so that it can kill that virus. So... so a, a temperature is sacred. A cold, a histamine response is sacred. These are the body's elimination processes to deal with things, uh, you know, like parasites and viruses. Um, and and it's not always that good to fight the process once it started. Well, but years ago, you see, when they eradicated the homeopathy and told them to go, you know, get out. Um, everything was about suppression. So here, we're going to give you something to mask this symptom or to stop a natural process that our creator endowed in us. So, yeah, I have always felt like it's best to allow the natural process to the body, just like I would rather draw something out instead of trap it inside. Yeah, yeah. So those cold suppressants um, may actually be doing you more harm than good because that dumping process can't happen. It's like taking out the garbage. What are you going to do? Leave it at the front door? It's going to stink up the house. Well, and this see, is how cancer's fall. Especially, say, in a bee blood types case, it is so easy when they're young before they have control over their choices to wind up in a cycle of antibiotics and that's where the right that's what, yeah exactly uh be very very careful with raw and undercooked foods because you're susceptible to e coli and and so see now here we are again uh, especially someone that's as earthy as yourself someone talks to you you know, about raw foods or, or walking along the forest and picking something up and eating it. Oh, yeah, I, I pick berries and mushrooms and eat right. them off the ground all the time <laughs> in the forest. Well, as long as you keep your immune system up, you've got that warrior immune system, you'll be fine. But, but you see all these little tiny things do make a difference. And so it was so smart that you did not move the teepee with the fluke water area. You know, uh, it, it uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the health, the health risks of that, you know. Now, the other thing that they talk about here with viral nervous system disorders is fibromyalgia, and of course, you spoke about wheat earlier, and they mm -hmm. say grains are at the top of the list known to induce joint inflammation. Interesting. Yes. Okay, of course, these are especially susceptible to things like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and scleroderma, scleroderma, which, yeah. yeah. Now, of course, we know arthritis is just a drying up or crystallization of subglobial fluid, and that's the stuff that keeps everything moving in your joints. So when we talk about all these good things like eat for our blood type and things, that's where the apple cider vinegar comes in. Uh, yeah, yeah. Such a blessing for any joints. And do you know what else is weird? What? I never knew this. Okay, now this is creepy. Most people think that worms and parasites are just 
in their intestines or around their organs of elimination, <laughs> these things can actually lodge in joints. Oh my goodness. So there's your arthritis on a whole other level. Wow. And it's all about reducing inflammation. That's why I really love Dr. Dick because he yeah. used a line, and he still does, yeah. a line of supplements that reduces the virus because, you know, once they get to that place where they've, they've tipped the scales and overrun and everything, I mean, people are desperately ill. So this is kind of a, a supplement that can freeze, like you were talking about temperature, whether it's freeze or reduce these viruses. And that's yeah. why I love his line. Okay, so we've done the B blood type. Let's do the O. Because the O, of course, we go back to survival of the fittest, and at one time, they would have been 100% of the blood type, or 100% of the population. Yes. And what's interesting is even the statistics between 2012 and 2016, see the O's are on the decline. So whether they are the super soldiers that they are using, or whether they are just, say, what they consider to be useless eaters, they're easy to pick off. Mm. The good news for the yes. genetic manipulation and depopulation program how it might be targeting certain blood groups because they want certain genetics to be bred out of the human um, mosaic genomes. Very interesting, Susie. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the good news for typos, they're extroverted, leaders, confident, pragmatic, strategic, patient, and logical. The ancestral prototype was a canny, aggressive predator. It was instinctual for typos to strive for position to leave the weak and feeble behind in order for the majority to survive. That almost sounds like a little karma, doesn't it? <laughs> what comes around goes around, right? Yeah. yeah. As, above, as above, so below. Right. Yeah. At, at their best, a typo can be powerful and productive. Conversely, a typo under a great deal of stress may demonstrate the extremes of these qualities. It is the O's birthright to harness the remarkable psychological strengths that are a part of the genetic heritage. Wired for efficiency, the digestive, metabolic, and immune systems act in concert to promote strength and endurance. Type O is very hardy, offering a natural, a natural aversion to cancer with a better survival rate than A blood types. <clears throat> Type O's rely on physical exercise to maintain physical health and emotional balance. The act of physical exercise releases a swarm of neurotransmitter activity that acts as a tonic for the entire system. Something to bring up here real quick. Most of the people that get diagnosed with these bullshit disorders like ADD, ADHD, you know, you got some kind of thing in my jig going crazy. That is because they have low levels of the happy hormones. Mm -hmm. And things like that. And you think about some of these designer drugs, like say once you do them, your natural happy hormones quit working. So what a great way to target a specific group. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, typos rely. <laughs> yeah, they work great with an Atkins low carb lifestyle, right? Now it's very difficult for O to be a successful vegetarian. I've known so many oh. apps that they wanted to be vegetarian, yeah. but they spiritual calling yeah. to do so. But, but they 
struggle with it, right? Because my mum struggles with it and and she's like, but I need my meat. And, you know, I raised my sons in a, in a vegetarian conscious household, but their dad was, um, and he just found it so hard because he was obviously on your neck as well. And, uh, and, and, oh, and my own sons can't, you know, be vegetarian as much as I've tried to encourage them, you know, because I was a natural vegetarian and, you know, philosophically caught on to and, uh, but they, they can't do it. And yeah, this is my family. My mother can't do it. My, my ex-husband can't do it. My children can't do it. They're all opposed. <laughs> and, and we have to remember that those have the most restrictions on their dietary or lifestyle. See, this yeah. is a diet. This is a lifestyle, for real. Yeah. Yeah. Most restrictions where yeah. you have the widest parameters to eat healthy. Mm. Yeah. So here's the bad news for the typo. They produce high levels of catecholamines and low levels of MAO when stressed. Now, the oh, only thing that I know about MAO. Oh, I know I know heaps about MAOs. All right, well, let me let me let me share this one with you. Oh. Being a needle folk. Whenever I had any kind of medical work done, I demanded a topical um, number called Emla Cream. And mm -hmm. on the back of those directions, it always said, you cannot use this if you're on any MAO inhibitors. Okay. Typo stress response can cause bouts of excess anger, temper oh. tantrums, hyperactivity and even create a severe enough chemical imbalance to bring about a manic episode. Wow, that just so talks about my family. That's really hitting home for me right now. Yeah. <laughs> what my marriage ended, um, you know, and some of the behaviors in my, um, my family. Yeah, so, wow. And, and, you know, Alicia, I mean, surely, we can look back over the course of history and see why it was so unfair to be in a family that arranged a marriage and you thought it was just because of maybe money or power. But in the background, they knew about the, compat the compatibility and the blood degree, uh, the blood pedigrees. And, and not only that, not only what you're talking about with these, um, you know, elite royal lineages, but we have a look at the Australian indigenous ancestors. Um, they they actually called it skin groups. And there was the grandmothers that were keeper of the knowledge of the skin groups. So if two young people were looking at a love marriage or if there was um, um, two families that wanted to come together and join their son and daughter, they would Every day your scalp comes under attack from heat, sweat, and pollution, which causes discomfort and aggravates antrip, so it keeps coming back. Let me show you the difference when you use head and shoulders regularly. Unlike ordinary shampoos, head and shoulders washes away dandruff and forms an invisible shield that continuously helps protect your scalp. So there is no reason anyone should suffer from dandruff again. Stay protected every week, month, year. It's easy. Stay plate free for life. Head and shoulders, live head first come together and join their son and daughter, they would consult with the keepers of this knowledge, usually the grandmothers in the tribe, who were the keepers of the skin law, L-O-R-E, and they would decide whether, um, and certain families, it was, it was forbidden to marry into, it didn't marry, it didn't matter if, you know, the families or the, or the young people wanted it or not. Um, and it was forbidden and it was respected and it was because of these things. Now, the Australian Indigenous, you know, we talked about off-planet ancestors before, um, the Australian Indigenous Queen of Gondwana, Jinki, who's a friend of mine, um, she's from the uh, 13 original grandmothers that first seeded this planet um, and settled on the continent of Australia. And she says that her old people 
say that they came from the, from the 80s, from the stars. Um, so, um, and we'll talk about more of the ancient origins uh, on my show coming up on a Tuesday morning in Australia and Monday night, Progressive World. Um, so, yeah, it's really interesting when we have a look at, you know, the origins and the temperaments of the family, as you were mentioning, Sue, so being back. And, and, you know, something that Joe taught me, because as a weapons expert, say, if you look at an old sword or an old gun, where blood has been, even if it's been cleaned, like we know in forensics, it can eat that metal. So back in the old days, the way they could tell if somebody's blood was compatible was if two people were coming together to, you know, reproduce, they could take a drop of blood from each one of those people and put it on some kind of a a piece of metal or a piece of glass or a, or a slide where they would be together and those bloods would not mix. They'd be like oil and water and actually go like this. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. All right, 13 minutes. We're going to crunch this. Okay. <clears throat> Typo is also more vulnerable and destructive and this is when they're overtired, angry, depressed, or bored. Um, they can take up activities like pathological gambling, sensation seeking, risk taking, substance abuse, and being impulsive. If the type O individual experiences elevated stress levels, unhealthy behaviors, poor diet, or lack of exercise, negative metabolic effects like insulin resistance, sluggish thyroid activity, edema, and weight gain. I'm going to bet you most of the diabetics are going to be O's, but with the way that they've worked their little uh, chemical poisoning, say high fructose corn syrup will make a diabetic out of any blood type. As an A blood type, sugar is my fuel. So if I take in organic turbinado sugar and I'm just I'm just gonna keep going and be fine, but everybody's different. So O's we have like we talked about in the beginning a lot of digestive conditions like GERD, ulcers, and also Crohn's disease, which is an inflammatory bowel disease. The specific metabolic conditions include Syndrome X, and that's because, of course, it's connected to the B, so we, we see that again. And blood clotting disorders. So the O blood type is kind of thin naturally, and, and Joe always related it to different weights of motor oils required for different engines in cars. Um, a blood types like myself and Joe, we have thick, sticky blood. We we yeah. can coagulate easy. Uh, that's, that's that's an anaerobic condition, which could be uh, related to susceptibility to have cancer. So always, uh, you need to balance your blood um, and make it more pH on the alkaline side of things. So more lemon juice and apple cider vinegar for you and bicarb soda and water drinks for you. Um, if your blood type tends to coagulate more um, or, or be thick um, and hydrate, like just constantly get, get onto the water um, and yeah, really assist your pH along if it tends to stick together. Because if it's stick together, if it's sticky blood, there's not, not so many oxygen molecules can dock on the on each individual blood cell. And, and what you want is fluffy, effervescent um, blood, um, oxygenated blood, not sticky, heavy, anaerobic, because it's in the anaerobic condition that cancer grows. And that's why we want <clears throat> elixir water or water that's been put through a micro oxygenation process to make the little 
oxygen molecules tiny so we can absorb them instead of these big clogging oxygen molecules that's in the water that comes out of the sink that we can't get any nutrition from. Okay, we've got five minutes. Oh my goodness. All right. We have specific immune conditions for the O, which is candida, thyroid, and any inflammation stuff. The miscellaneous is very important. O children should be given an oral polio, not the injected form, and never give an O child acetamiophen or Tylenol. Oh, wow. Which is Panadol, Yep. Oh, pregnant women should avoid flu vaccine, especially if the baby's daddy is a type A or a type AB. Type A behavior is linked to disorders such as due to dental ulcer and heart attacks. And O's need to avoid MAL inhibitors and St. John's wort. We're going to hit my blood type, <coughs> which is an A. And of course, our uh, good characteristics are we're intense, inventive, demanding, perfectionist, sensitive, cooperative, and creative. We have a, gen a genetic disposition that favors a structured, rhythmic, harmonious life surrounded by a positive, supportive community. This, my dear, is why I'm considered to be Susie selfish because I put myself first in order to do those things so I could take care of others. So mm -hmm. see, like we're in service to the greater but I would have never been able to be here with you guys unless I would have put myself first and stepped out of that paradigm or, the, or, or box. And this is in every regard. So um, a type A best exemplifies the powerful interconnectedness of mind and body. We have low incidence for serious ailments that plague us. Seldom do you see an A blood type really sick. We're the ones that were fine until we drop. And when we drop, they say, what happened to that person? Who, who cares? As long as we feel good while we're going, I've been fine with that. They say we really need our eight hours of sleep. We can have all the carbs we want. We should do some yoga and tai chi instead of hardcore physical aerobics. I always like the physical stuff. See, that's how I was dealing with my stress. Yeah. Um, they say that we do very well to do art or write, um, which I do a lot of. And here's one of my best ones. Okay. So the way I get all my stuff done, Alicia, is that I give myself the freedom to work on what I want to work. So for a few hours, I do mental work. Then I do some spiritual work, then I do some physical work, then I do some artistic work. That's how I live. Um, the bad news for A's, like I said, is we have way too much adrenaline and cortisol, which is the natural stress hormone. Yeah. Yes. Um, we can have early aging with our bones and skins if we don't take care of ourselves. And if we don't resolve a matter, it becomes a chronic stressor, which is why I also speak up and tend to be an activist of sorts. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, of course, we're prone to cancer. We're, we can battle with Barrett's esophagus, which is a precancerous condition. We're, we are susceptible to gallbladder and liver disease. And um, we're going to leave it at that. We have under one minute, the AB blood type, okay, that is only 2% of the population, like our dear Randy Moggins, okay? Emotional, passionate, friendly, trusting, and empathetic. I'm going to tell you it's less than 2% of the population. They like to imply it's more. There's a reason for that. We'll have to discuss on another show. Yeah. And they are a work in progress. They are always evolving and mutating 
and adjusting to what is going on in the world now. They're the most dynamic blood group that's coming up. With the, the, the new genetic and super children, I think, are going to be we're going to be seeing more of these coming onto the planet now. And of course, it would also support and confirm spirit on the idea that we are all children of Creator God. Yeah. So, I really appreciate your time today. You woke up so early to be here. I just. I'm so honored that you took time to come on the show today, Alish. And we do have another couple shows worth of information. I didn't even yeah, touch. Let's, on let's let's go. Let's come back again and and do and do some more work on blood groupings and nutrition and, and maintaining health. I think we've got a good dynamics too that I'd love to share more too. So thank you so much for having me on the show. Thank you to Vivi and Mel. Please support CCN. I couldn't have said it better myself. It's perfect. So with that, well, friends, peace, love, Of and course, life. we don't Maybe get to do any more shows together. But that's okay. I still appreciate you, Alicia, if you ever check this video out.